Good morning, Boker Tov. It should be a good morning for Kal Yisrael. May we hear Besoros Tovos. Please, God, we should hear good news. Hostages should be home. Our soldiers should return to their families in a sweeping, sweeping victory. I want to thank our Parsha series sponsors for the year, Becky and Abby Katz and family, in memory of Becky's father, Lili Nishmas, David Ben Menachem, Manish David Grossman. Today's show is also sponsored by Eli Nami Buzaglo in commemoration of his father's yurt site. Yosef Ben Mossad Buzaglo's Neshama should have an Aliyah. Thank you so much. We are uh, last Parsha share till after Pesach. It's not my fault because there is no Parsha. So this is Shabbos Agadol. We still read Parsha's Mitzorah. And then next week is Pesach, Shabbos Chalamoid. And then uh, it will be Pesach the Tuesday morning. Still Pesach, right? Pesach is over Tuesday night. So we'll resume the Tuesday, a week following uh, Pesach. We will resume. But this week we have the privilege of learning and reading and studying Parsha's Mitzorah, page 620 in the Art Scroll Stone Chumash. If you enjoy Parshas Tazria, you're going to love Parshas Mitzorah. <laughs> it's basically an extension, a continuation of many of the same themes, notably the halacha of the Mitzorah, the individual who used and abused the power of speech, didn't use it to uplift and to construct and to support and to inspire and to comfort, used it to destroy and to denigrate and to marginalize. And they use their power of speech for gossip, for splant, uh, slander, and to judge others. And the individual, of course, it results in tzara'ah. So let's examine some more now as the parsha continues in Mitzorah along the same line, along the same theme. We're going to start out with three insights of Rav Druk in his Lavos Eish. The first, it says in the Pasuk, Zostia Toras HaMetzorah, Biyom Taraso. This is the Torah of the Mitzorah on the day that he is purified. And what's the Torah of the Mitzorah? The Torah, the law of the Mitzorah, is that he's brought to the Kohen. This individual spoke ill about another. But these blemishes, the spiritual leprosy, is the result of negative speech. How does that happen? Why does someone speak negatively about somebody else? Says Rav Druk, the answer is, Omer La'atzmo, such an individual says to himself, Makvar Asisi, what did I do that was so bad? I didn't punch someone, I didn't shoot someone, I didn't steal from someone, I didn't injure or harm somebody. It's words. Makvar Dibarti, Bisacha Kol Kamamilim. I said a few words, okay, guilty is charged. Caught me at a bad moment, a weak moment, a negative moment, and I said something negative. It was just words. Did I really hurt anybody? I said some words, inappropriate words. I misused my words. But because of that, you got this whole thing. I have to go chutzpah machana, live sequestered, secluded, I have to go through a whole purification process. So that's what the Torah is responding to. And the Torah says, It's a brilliant insight of Rav Druk. What's the law? What's the halacha? The individual has to be brought to the Kohen. Why? Why are you brought to the Kohen? Is it objectively or not objectively? It's a ras. I don't know what the equivalent of WebMD is for spiritual maladies, but a person suspects they broke out in saras. Go on WebMD for spiritual maladies and check it out. Google images for saras. Uh, yeah, I think I got saras. Or no, I don't think this is saras. What do you have to be brought to the Kohen? And the Kohen, Rav Druk, Rav Druk doesn't say this explicitly, but the Kohen actually has enormous power because the individual is not defined, doesn't have the status or identity of Mitzorah, doesn't have to go through the process of rehabilitation until, unless the Kohen pronounces them, Tame. Power is all in the Kohen's hands. So much so the Rambam codifies what Chazal tell us, that if an individual is in the Shiva Simei Mishta, they're in the Sheva Brachas, they got married. Could you imagine? Fashter the Simcha. Imagine what happens to Sheva Brachas. The night after one of my daughter's weddings, it was during the Corona wedding, we all wore masks and separated and was small and outdoor, all the things. But the first Sheva Brachas, the next night, my son in law comes to me and he says, Abba, I don't know how to tell you this and I don't know what to do. I can't smell and I can't taste anything. So I said, you got to get you gotta get checked. We got to let everybody know. Baruch Hashem, he was just a tired, exhausted chassan who had a cold and not Corona. It was negative. For Corona. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. But can you imagine if I share the whole simcha? The chasen has saras. 
So the Rambam says, no, no, the Kohen doesn't look, doesn't declare, doesn't examine. What that helps? I, I know there were people who felt if you didn't get tested for corona, you didn't have it. But that's not the way it works. If you have a disease that is contagious, it's not a function of whether the doctor or the test declares it. So by not going to the Kohen, you could avoid it. And therefore, a person could celebrate the Sheva Brachas or conversely mark Shiva or whatever the case may be. Says Rav Druk, listen to this insight. You know why Vahuva ala Kohen? Because this individual thought, it's just words. What power do words have? So I gossiped, I slandered, I spoke negatively. It was just some words. The answer is, look at the words of the Kohen. The power of words, when the Kohen declares you Tameh, your life is upside down. If he didn't declare you Tameh, then your life continues as normal. You see the power of words. Words have the ability to create reality. It is the speech of the Kohen that creates reality. And that's why the answer is this individual, let's go to the Kohen. Let's go to the Kohen, WebMD, Google Images, let me check it out. Now the answer is it's not a function of objectively do you have it. The coin has to declare it because you're going to see the power of words. So what's the Torah Samatsora? Zostia Torah Samatsora, Vuhuva El Hakoin. The answer, the antidote, the message, the rehabilitation of the Matsora is Vuhuva El Hakoin. Go to the Kohen and see the power of words. I shared with you before this was Rosalvichik's insight. Why the holiest night of the year? Kol Nidre night. We call it Kol Nidre night. But Yom Kippur night, there's so many things that we could say. So many parts of liturgy that would move us. And what do we sing? What do we say? Kol Nidre. We list off these really boring laws of oaths and promises and pledges. And we do Hataras Nadarim collectively. And that's the entrance into the holiest day of the year. Like sit on the floor and sing Achenu. Let's have a, a, a Kumzitz. Kol Nidre, like people don't look at the English. If you would, if you would actually, the Chazan would sing, all oaths, you know, sing Kol Nidre with that haunting melody in the English. It'd be what in the world is going on right now? That's how you start Yom Kippur. Rav Salavitchik said, "Yeah, you're about to stand before Hashem for 25 hours. You say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I kumta, I should have, I shouldn't have, I should have. Words matter. Words mean something. Words count. You want to know how you see that words matter?" Nidarim, a nether. What's a nether? A promise, a pledge, an oath. You know, right now, that chair is permissible. But if I say that chair is forbidden to me, like something that's forbidden, I can transform the status of the chair and turn it into a piece of chazashmatz. It could be as forbidden to me as pork. It could be as forbidden to me as a cheeseburger. All through my words. Words have power. Words have meaning. Words can alter reality. We have to remember the power of words, not only in halacha, but interpersonally. Our words matter. Somebody calls you and says, I'm thinking about doing business with him. Be careful with your words. What do you think? You're on the shidduch resume. Tell me about him. You could make or destroy a shidduch. You could make or destroy a parnasa, a livelihood. Words matter. They mean something. So the individual who didn't realize the power of words and misuse them to speak negatively of another, what's the Torah Samitzora? The antidote, the Torah of the Mitzorah is Vuhuva ala Kohen, be brought to the Kohen. That is Rav Druk number one. Rav Druk number two. The Mishnah in the Gaim tells us, Mitzorah shenichmas lebayis kol hakilim sheish sham tamei mafilu ad koros. That a Mitzorah who enters the house, all the utensils, everything in the house is contaminated, takes on the status of Tumah, even until the beams of the house. Rav Shimon Omer, ad arba amos kilim miyat tamei. Rav Yudah Omer, im shah kideh ad lakas anir. So there's a machlokas in the Mishnah of the Gaim, 13th parak of Negaim. Is it just when the Mitzorah enters the house, they contaminate everything? Or is it only the four Amos around them? Or do they have to remain in the house long enough to light a candle? The Mitzorah contaminates the place they dwell. So when they enter a house with permission, and they're entitled to be there, they contaminate, they transfer their tumma, their impurity on everything in the house. But how long? So Yudah says it's not called the place of their dwelling unless they're in the house long enough to light a candle. 
seems kind of arbitrary. Why don't you say until they're they're long enough to make a potato kugel? <laughs> they're long in the house long enough to. I don't know. Check the stock market. How, why do we arbitrarily choose the definition of it being their dwelling? How do you define in the house for the length of a dwelling long enough to light a candle? Seems kind of arbitrary. If nobody kicked you out of the house and said, Get out! You tell me! You're going to ruin everything! Within the time it takes to light the candle, they're out. So, Lavin, why, why Davka this length of time? Says Rav Juk, this individual, part of the rehabilitation is they have to live and dwell where? Outside of the camp. Badad. Alone. Echa yashva badad. On we read Echa. And we bemoan, we mourn, we grieve how we were all alone. And it feels like it again. It didn't for a moment, and hopefully it can remain. One of the most incredible miracles of Motzei Shabbos was not just knocking down 300 missiles. Maybe you saw this write-up by a physicist who said, we don't begin to understand what it means. 99% being, being knocked down, the miracle that it is. Drones, ballistic missiles, all kinds of concoction of missiles, all mixed and layered over each other, and yet knocking them all down. It's a miracle. You know what else is a miracle? That Saudi Arabia and Jordan and UA, these countries all helped. It's a miracle. So for a little bit, we don't feel alone for, for five minutes. Hopefully it can last and it continue. But the Jewish people know what it means to be alone. It's painful to be alone. It compounds whatever you're going through to go through it alone. That's why we have a mitzvah, Bikr Cholom, Nicham Avelam, to show up, to show up, to be present, to offer companionship, because that can help provide strength and support when a person is going through something that's difficult. So this mitzvah, what do we do? We say, go be alone. You're in time out. Badad Yeshev, alone. Chutz Lamachan and Moshevo, outside the camp. Why? Yochan Shemalevit says, because when they gossiped and slandered another, you know what they did? They made that person feel alone. When you speak negatively about somebody, if you're the victim, if you're the subject of Lashon Hara, you feel alone. You want? Does everyone believe that? How could they just stand by and accept that and listen to that? Is this what everyone's saying about me? You see somebody posts online and or you heard a conversation at a Shabbos table where somebody says something, gets back to you, they said, you feel very, very alone. So the individual gossip made people feel alone. Part of their rehabilitation is they have to go outside and be alone. And be alone. The whole notion of lighting a candle is to illuminate, dispel the darkness, to create connection. Why do we light the candles on Friday night? The whole Hadlakas Neira Shabbos is Shalom Bayes. That's why a person who has limited resources, they can buy either Shabbos candles or Hanukkah candles. Hanukkah candles commemorate a miracle. Miracle. Pirsum Anais. Yet, which do you spend the money on? Where do you allocate it? The Shabbos candle or the Hanukkah candles? I'm the only rabbi speaking about Hanukkah on Erev Pesach. <laughs> Shabbos candles. Why? Because Shabbos is Shalom Bayes. Lighting the candles is Shalom Bayes. When you light a candle in a home and you have Shalom Bayes, this is no longer your dwelling place. You, whose soul, you who sow disruption, you who sow dispute and divide and division, you don't belong in a house with a candle that's lit. So that's why, he says, Rav Druk, where do we come up with this arbitrary measure? How long is it to be in a house that you consider dwelling there that you would contaminate and transfer impurity the time it takes to light a candle? Because he didn't light candles. He extinguished candles. He created machlokas through his speech. Third Rav Druk, and then we'll move on, all in the opening pasuk of our parsha. It's a short parsha. Zostia Torah Samatzor Yom Taras The Medrash Rabbah says, Zostia Torah Samatzor What's the connection between this is the law of the Metzorah and to the wicked, Hashem said, 
Why are you talking about my chukim? So it says Rav Juk the following. The individual who gets diagnosed, the Kohen diagnoses him with taras, his skin, the surface has revealed the pnim, what's inside. And what's inside is pretty rotten. If you could sit and be so judgmental and hypercritical and slander and gossip and hurt and harm and marginalize others, it's pretty rotten inside. You're pretty rotten inside. It's are the result of seven violations. Lashon hara, shvichos damim, gossip, murder, false promises, promiscuity, arrogance, theft, looking with a, a, a critical eye. Because the Russia is wicked, Hashem's not really interested in his Torah. What does it mean, his Torah? You know, the Russia always has like the world according to me. Here's the way I see it. Here's my principle. Here's my perspective. You know what Hashem says? I don't really care. I'm paraphrasing Hashem there. Hashem says, I, I, don't, I don't really care about your perspective and your policies and your principles and your approach to life. So therefore it says, It's like HaKadosh Baruch Rak biyom taharaso. When is the Mitzorah and his principle and his Torah accepted to Hashem? Only on the day that he becomes pure. Quotes a Pasuk in Tehillim. The Medrash is connecting that Pasuk to here. Hashem says, what do I care about your perspective? What do I care about your principled stance? What do I care about your view of life? You're a Russia. You're rotten in your core. Your judgment, your negativity, your gossip. I care about your view of life. I don't really care. When will I care again? When? Only? continues and he says, You know, a Russia also has the ability to manipulate and distort and pervert the Torah of Hashem to see the world through their eyes, through the prism of their view, and then to make the Torah conform, to distort the Torah. So it's called the Torah, Torah Samitzorah. This Torah Samitzorah. Why does someone gossip and slander? Because here's the world according to me. You know those people? We all know those people. They have something to say about everyone. This one is stingy, and this one is selfish, and this one is this, and this one is that. I'll warn you. You know what the problem is about hanging around such people? They're also talking about you. So when you listen and you're an accomplice to them, when you're at their Shabbos table and you're willing to sit there and be a spectator while they're sharing their opinion about the whole world and everyone in it, next Shabbos they're having someone else over and they're talking about you. So be careful. Be careful who you're friends with and be careful who you're a passive spectator to because while it's easy and it's fun and you're earning social uh, commodity by listening, next Shabbos they're talking about you. That's the Torah Samitzorah. Torah Samitzorah. Torah is unlike every other discipline in the world because Torah penetrates, Torah molds, Torah fashions, person that turns somebody into a ben Torah. That's why Chochma Begayim Ta'amin believe that there's wisdom, chemistry, biology, physics. There's all kinds of wisdoms in the nations of the world. But wisdom can be academic, conceptual, separate and apart from personality and performance. Torah is supposed to mold us and shape us into a ben Torah, a bas Torah. Torah is supposed to actually change us, transform us. That's why the Mishnah of us has Memches Kinyanam Shah Torah Nikhnes Pam. There are 48 ways that Torah is acquired. Why? There are 48 personality traits, 48 ways we work on ourselves. You can't acquire Torah, it can't penetrate, it doesn't mold in fashion, it doesn't transform you unless it comes with also. Better, a better personality. Before we were united and together, we couldn't have Torah. It was the prerequisite. So a person who's self-centered, who's selfish, who's narcissistic, a person who sees the world and has an opinion and a judgment of everyone and everything in it, they're not actually observing Hashem's Torah. Whose Torah are they observing? Torah Samitzorah. It's the Torah Samitzorah. They've interchanged, they've changed their Torah for Hashem's Torah. 
And that such a person needs to be mechutz l'machana. Such a person needs to be outside the camp. They need to realize what's happened, and they need to come back to embrace the Torah of Hashem, not to have the Torah of the Mitzora. Three Rav Druks we opened with. We turn to the Amaros Taharos. The Helega Rach Meshlef Gareba, Aleinu, passed away this year. And he says two ideas. The word, Zostia Sataros and Mitzora B'yom Tarasov, Huva Lakawin. He quotes the Moore Naim. Who was the Moore Naim? The Chernobyl, Rav Menachem Nochem of Chernobyl. Hine Razal Chazal Sein Erchen Dav Tesayin. Darsha Mitzora Natrikon Motsi Ra. Where does the word Mitzora come from? Mitzora is, Mitzora is a conjunction of two words, Motsi, Ra. Shekol Mesapar Lashonar Negayim Bayim Alav. In other words, our words create reality. We didn't appreciate this as much until this generation that we can now. You know why? I'm not going to try it right now because your phones are going to all respond and light up and things are going to happen. You ever, you ever on Shabbos talking at the Shabbos table, be careful because the technology in the other room are going to turn on the blender. You got to be careful. Today, we have speech recognition. You can do, you could sit on your couch, sit back in your recliner, and tell your phone what to do. Turn on the oven, get the mixer going. You can talk into your phone, and your Tesla will come pick you up because it's raining outside. I stood next to somebody who did that. Tesla with the automatic driving. You can if it's raining under the canopy. You don't want to get wet. You tell the car to come pick you up. We're living like George Jetson time. We're living in future. We're living in crazy times. So every day in our davening we say, Baruch Sha'amar Olam. Kodesh Baruch you spoke and you created a world. Be'eser Ma'amaros Nivra Olam. With ten sayings, Hashem created the whole world. You know who else creates and destroys worlds? We do. We do. We can create and destroy worlds with our power of speech. So we always gave that as like a nice rabbi homiletical idea, right? We can create and destroy with our words. Be nice. Sticks and stones. Whatever. Words can hurt me. Words create. But we see it in reality today. Words create. Words can launch wars. Apparently the word don't doesn't mean anything. But other words can do things. Other words can do things and mean things. So this individual who abused their power of speech, they were motzi ra. They brought evil into the world. Motzi, they brought it, they fashioned, they created evil in the world. Torah is called the first. The Jewish people are called the first. And Yisrael be'enei HaKadosh Baruch HaKam HaChashuvim Be'yikarim Lefnei HaKadosh Baruch Jewish people are considered to be great and precious before Hashem. At Shirak B'Shvilam Baruch Kol Olam The whole world was created just in the merit of Jewish people. V'adem Mekab HaShem Yisbaruch Tanu Ko'ach Le'echa Mehem Bekos of HaShana Afilu Mirash HaGadol God gets great satisfaction from every one of His children including those who we would call a Russia. Because after all, we're Hashem's children. It's past Shabbos. Rav Kalish spoke about it over and over again. There's nothing like the prayer of a parent who loves a child unconditionally and says, Hashem, I have to and I do love this child who is complicated to love, who brings shame and challenge and difficulty, costs me an enormous amount and makes me worry, and I love him or her unconditionally. You're my father. You need to love me even when I misbehave, even if I bring you shame. That is the most heartfelt prayer that there is. So even this Russia, Kaddish Baruch who loves, because we're his children. When you speak about one of God's children negatively, you're making him sad. You're making Hashem sad about you. Hashem was getting tremendous nachas. He had oneg, he had pleasure and joy and a geshmak from all of his children, even the Russia, even the child, even the fifth child. You know, at the Seder next week, we'll talk about the four sons. There's a fifth son. The fifth son is the one who doesn't even make it to the Seder. Maybe they come for Pesach, they don't want to come to the Seder. But the parent still says, but you're all home. Put on a yarmulke, no yarmulke, earrings, piercings, tattoos, whoever you brought home with you, but you're here. And I have oneg. I'm focused on the pleasure and the joy and the eye and the oneg. And then you go and you gossip and you marginalize. And then you go, you're critical and you speak Lashon Hara. And now for Hashem, you turned his oneg into nega, the ayin. Hatikun lezehu eisek ha-Torah. Ki me'achashavidvaro 
So if you abuse the power of speech by speaking negatively, how do you repair the power of speech by speaking Torah positively? The vocabulary and the language of Torah. And that says the Rach Meshivka, that says the Chernobyl, the Morinayim, that's what our opening Pasuk is telling us. Zostia Torah Hametzorah. And how do you know how to speak that? So what's the answer? The Metzorah needs to learn the speech, the vocabulary of Torah. Where do they learn? How do you learn how to talk like a Ben Torah? You know, the speech that's beneath us, below us. We grew up with that. It's a very Jewish idea. It's Pasnish. It's Pasnish. It's beneath you to speak like that. I, but the, you know, it used to be, you'd say the FCC, what do they call it? FCC? Who the regulates the public channels? FCC. Their standards already are nothing. Today, in the middle of the day, you could have uh, curses on regular TV. Uh, but it didn't, it didn't make it their list, so it's not really obscene or profane. Yes, it is. A ben Torah doesn't use that word. Ben Torah doesn't speak like that. A Bas Torah doesn't speak like that. It's obscenity, profanity. We have our own list. You know, it's, it's beneath us. There's a Torah. There's a Torah to our vocabulary. There's a Torah to our, how we speak, how we carry ourselves, how we dress, who we are. This Metzorah who was Motsi Ra, who gave birth and brought wickedness and evil into the world by speaking negatively about a peer, a fellow Jew, a sibling. So now they need to learn the proper vocabulary. How do you learn the proper vocabulary? It's the vocabulary of the Torah, the Metzorah, it's the Torah. And how do they go learn it? Where do they learn it from? Rosetta Stone. Where do you go learn the vocabulary of Torah? How to speak Torah? Vuhuva el Akoin. You go to the Kohen, because the Kohen is the teacher of every generation. They're the light of every generation. Go to the Kohen. That's the Chernobyl. The Igor de Kala has another interpretation. Why does it introduce with this whole expression, this phrase, Why not just start with the law, which is Biyom Tara Samatsora Yuva Ela Kohen. On the day of his becoming pure, bring him to the Kohen. Zost Yatara Samatsora Biyom Tara. It's all extraneous. It's all superfluous. It's unnecessary. So it says, the Amaras Tahoros, Kinib Hemshech Akas of Nemar, Vitziva Kohen, Velakach Lamitaher, Shtait Sipar. And we continue when you take two birds, an eight eras, a cedar tree, and Shnitolas. And Rashi says, why do you take two birds? What do birds do? Chirp, 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 chirp. And what did this person do? Chirp, 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 chirp. What do birds do? They tweet. And what did this person do? They used Twitter too much. They tweeted things they shouldn't have tweeted. Eight eras. Why else do they come? Arrogance. And there the eras comes to humble. Shnitolas. And these ingredients, these materials are lowly, and we have to humble the person. So these aren't random. You don't use the two birds and the cedar and the shnitolas of the worm. You're not using all these, just some random recipe, concoction, some formula, some prescription. Each of these ingredients should make the Mitzorah be mindful and pause and say, I'm, like, I'm just a lowly worm food. That's what I'm going to be in the end of days. Who am I to sit in judgment of others? And the birds, they chir- I can't chirp so much. i got to be much more thoughtful and regulate how I speak, what I speak. So that's what it's telling us. Zostia Torah Samatsora, don't just superficially go through this as if it's some punishment, but Hashem doesn't give arbitrary punishments. Whenever Hashem prescribes a response, a reaction, a reality, it's always Mida Keneged Mida. There's something to learn. There's an ability to be transformed by it. And that's why it's Torah, Zostia Torah Samatsora, learn what is the deeper message and deeper idea in two birds and the eight errors and the Shnitolas. And so on and so forth. Perikidalad Pasuk base. Moving along. Gimel. The coin goes forth from the outside of the camp to go look and behold, and he sees Taka, it is 
It is tzaras. And as we just said, once the coin diagnoses it and says, Taka, it's Saras, he has to say Taka. He doesn't have to say Taka, he just has to say Tame. For the person being purified, two live clean birds, cedar wood, crimson thread, and hyssop, specifically those ingredients. Says Rabbi Salavetcha. Where does the coin go to see this individual? Where does he go? Viyatsa coin L. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. The coin goes outside the camp. Listen to what Rav Soloveitchik says. When we explore this pressure, we find a peculiar phenomenon. The coin here assumes the role of diagnostician and nurse. Only the coin is the right to pronounce the sick person clean or unclean. It's a task the coin would not normally be expected to perform, given the lens that he has to go to avoid impurity. How peculiar! The coin is a special warning. The coin can't go to the cemetery or the hospital that has a morgue. Cohen can't be in the same home with a dead body. Cohen can't come in contact with the sheriffs. The Cohen is a special warning. Be on guard. Be careful. Even a pregnant woman, she has a sonogram and finds out she's having a baby boy, perhaps can't go to the hospital. There's a whole discussion in halacha. Does she have to have a home delivery? She knows it's a boy because that boy already is a Cohen, and maybe the fetus Cohen is already warned and cautioned not to become impure, even in utero, maybe even already in the womb. It's a whole discussion. Do you rely on the sonogram to determine if it's a boy? Does she have to undergo a sonogram? Maybe ignorance is not plus. She has to know where she can go if she's carrying. Can a pregnant woman? It's a whole question. Should a can a pregnant woman go to a cemetery, a funeral? If Shechter holds a Baba Misa, she can go. Others are more cautious. BBGB, mysticism, superstition. But if does she have to check whether she's carrying a boy before she goes to a cemetery or a funeral? Whole discussion. So the Kohen is warned. Stay away. Be careful. Be vigilant, no tumma, until the Mitzvah. Then we say, go. Go Go to the leprosy camp. Go into the place of tumma. Go check out this, this leper. It's a task you'd never think to assign that would be assigned to a Kohen. Why is this job assigned to the Kohen? Furthermore, there are many forms of impurity in the Torah. Anyone with the required knowledge can help with the purification. Yet, Saras is assigned only to the Kohen. Send a dermatologist. Send a Levi or Yisrael. Send somebody who's not cautioned to be careful about impurity. Continues Rav Soloveitchik. Let us analyze the situation on the Mitzvah and the treatment of leprosy in biblical times. The phobia related to leprosy in olden times is similar to the phobia of modern malignancy. The greatest fear was the fear of discovery. One took sick, and the outward symptoms caused others to suspect he had leprosy. Immediately, the sick man lost his human dignity. He became isolated from the community. People were afraid to associate with him or even greet him. He was often killed or at the very least driven out of town. From time to time, he offered a meager supply of food thrown to him like food thrown to a dog. He was treated harshly for the sin of having contracted the disease. Might as well be talking about Corona. You remember in the early days of Corona? I, I remember my son-in-law got Corona during Hanukkah. He stood outside looking through the window while we, looked, while we lit the Hanukkah candles. He slept in the guest room detached from the house. We put food outside his door. He could come and take it. But God forbid, you know, with gloves and distance and mask and don't open your door till we leave. You remember the way we were and how that made people feel? Pesach's coming up. We'll never forget Pesach 2020. People at Seder all alone. Now, we should be taking stock. There should be a review. We should be evaluating what we did right, what we did wrong. We did the best with what we knew at the time and we deferred from the experts and that's our job to listen to. But they, the experts, and we with them should be looking back and learning from it. But there were people who were all alone. That pain of being alone. There's no question that it hastens people's death. The, the loneliness of it. The loneliness of it, of being alone. So that was leprosy. People who got leprosy, there are people alive old enough to remember leper colonies. And what happened when a person got leprosy and how they were made to feel? What is the Jewish approach? Says Rav Soloveitchik. The first thing the Torah demands, bring the coin. The leper was thus instantly removed from the mob psychosis. The Kohen diagnosed and pronounced the Tumma as Saras, but the leper was not subsequently cut off of society. He was in communication with the Kohen as one of the heads of the community. In fact, the Mitzorah could request being seen by the Kohen Gadol himself, a man who was not permitted to attend the funeral of his closest relatives. And yet, if the Kohen Gadol was summoned, he had to go to the leper. The Torah legislated to prevent the loss of human dignity. The Kohen went to the leper outside the camp to demonstrate that he was his friend. The Mitzorah was isolated from everyone except the leader, who must do everything possible to heal him and bring him back to society. The Kohen assures the man, you are needed. 
You will get well. You will return. We love you. We haven't forgotten you. The coin acts for the needs of the people. The message of Parshas Mitzora is that even someone who holds the exalted office of Kahuna must not abandon his fellow Jew. He must have his compassion for everyone, even someone as dangerously ill as the leper. Not only the Kohen, but the prophet as well was charged with the role of being such a friend. The prophet had to deliver the word of Hashem, but was also charged with the mission of helping individual man, of being a nursing father to the people of Israel. Moshe himself said, for the people come to me to seek Hashem. Compassion is the essential attribute of the spiritual leader of Kla Yisrael. What an insight of Rav Salavetcher. What a message it would send. Everybody was isolating. Everyone was withdrawing. Everyone was recoiling from this leper. And who went? Dafka the Kohen, who was so vigilant and so careful who he was exposed to, he went. Even the Kohen Gadol, who didn't go to the funeral of his own direct family, if summoned, went to go see the Mitzvah. Why? Because you know what leadership's about? Not making someone feel alone. Ba'asher Husham, going where they are to offer that love and that non-judgmental, uncom- unconditional companionship. It, it makes me think, when you read that inside of the Rav, it makes you think of the disco rabbi, Rabbi Grossman, Zalzayn Gesundten Stark, of Grossman, who never compromised an iota, a chassid shayid of who he is and how he dresses and how he conducts himself, but got the name disco rabbi because he'd go in Manhattan with Rabbi Riskin, should also be well, and would go into the discos on Friday night, on Shabbos, and befriend the Israelis who were there. And uh, Khalil, I'm not calling that a leper colony, but it means to go to uncomfortable places, to go to places that ordinarily we would be vigilant not to be exposed to, to go ba'asher husham and to connect and to be able to show love and to offer companionship and to be where the people are. The Tolna Rebbe, the Tolna Rebbe, also has a similar idea on our parsha. He talks about going out. The Kohen goes out. The Psikta Zutresa, in a different context in Parshas Bolok, comments the word Vihine, 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 Vihine near Panega. Look back at Pasuk Gimel. Vihine near Panega. When the Kohen goes out, where the Mitzorah is, Vihine, and behold, he's able to hear the heal the Nega. The word Vihine, what does Vihine ordinarily mean? Ain Vihine Ella? Simcha, joy. What's the joy? You go to a leper colony. You go into the disco. You go where the people are in order to connect. Vihine, there's joy, there's a geschmack. There's a geschmack. So, Vegam Hine, we go to the cross of Rebbe Samach Balibo. You see this elsewhere in Sefer Shmos. Aaron going out to greet you, he'll see you and rejoice in his heart. Hine, who Yotse, you see that Vihine comes with Simcha. The situation of Taras is when the coin's love for every Jew is manifest. This love does not come to their, the fore during normal times. When everything goes smoothly and the coin is together with his fellow Kohanim, basking in the glory of the Beis HaMikdash. You know when you see it? When the Kohen leaves the Beis HaMikdash. When he goes to work with the Mitzorah. That's when the powerful love the Kohen has for every Jew, that's when it can be seen and measured. That's when it's manifest. The Torah alludes to this manifestation of the coin's love. Neget saras kisiyah ba'adam v'huva el ha'koin. The final letters of the words v'huva el ha'koin, aleph lamed nun, says the Tolna Rebbe, are the first letters in David HaMelech's description of his love for Yonah's son. Neflesa avas chali me'avas nashim. Your love was more powerful to me than the love of women. The Mishnah Nebbas tells us the bond between David and Yonah's son is the quintessential ava she'ein etzliya ba'davar. You want to know a love between two friends that is not dependent on anything. There's no dependence. There's no conditions. There's no because you do for me. There's just love and loyalty. Is the love of David and Yehonah's son. This is the level of love the Kohen must feel for the Mitzvah when he goes out to camp to work with him. Likewise, the word min, neger atzaras, min hatzarua, alludes to me'avas nashim. In David and Mach's expression of his love for Yehonah's son. This is the love and love the Kohen has. And the Tolna Rebbe concludes... He says, today we don't have Mitzorahim. We don't have this diagnosis of spiritual lepers. But we have a lot of lost souls. We have a lot of people who are trying to find their way. And you know how we bring them back? When we go find them. When leaders, Dafka, the Kohanim of our generation, shower genuine love to these individuals to not send them away or leave them isolated and alone, but to go where they are, 
to go into the meetings, recovery, rehab, to go into the disco, and to go wherever they are, just as the Masorah sent away. The Gemara Megillah says, Kaddish Baruch Hu treats a person the way they treat others. So if we show our love even for those Jews who are far and distant and work to bring them closer, Hashem is going to bring us closer. He's going to show His love for us, says the Tolna Rebbe. And all this, a very similar idea, both between the Tolna Rebbe and of Salavechek, same idea of you see the responsibility and the definition of leadership where they're willing to go. You know, I, I was one of the early rabbis to use social media not to post dessert or about my kid's fever or about my vacation or about my birthday, but to share Torah articles to connect inspirational messages. And I got a lot of criticism at first. The world's caught up. All segments of the Torah world. Aguda has a Twitter handle. Satmar has a Twitter handle. I know that because after we went to see the Satmar Rebbe two weeks ago, they posted the pictures and talked about how great the Achtus of Satmar headquarters. The world has moved along. But what was the rationale? What was the reasoning? Not to Khalila compare those who engage the technology as being but to engage and to connect and to try to uplift and inspire and to bring light where people are and to find them and to find them there. Vihine nirpa. We said the word vihine nirpa. We said the word vihine always connotes joy, simcha. What's the simcha? What's the simcha? So the Rachma Shrifka, back to the Amaras Tahoros, he says, you know, when a person feels that they're isolated and alone, they're living in the and they've been put in time out by the community. You know, they beat themselves up. They knock themselves down. They feel enormous shame and sadness. But really the opposite can occur. Occur. When a person says, I made mistakes, I went wrong, I brought about this own reality, but I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to grow from it. I'm going to bounce back from it. There's not win or lose. There's win or learn. So this Mitzorah says, I'm going to learn. And if do us Hashem b'simcha. I have a lot of avoda to do to bounce back, but I'm going to do it b'simcha. Because when a person tries to bounce back with sadness, they only knock themselves further down. The only way to climb up, the only way to bounce back is besimcha. And that's why the word vihine is used here. Vira'a kohen. Kasher yira atzadak shirin kohen lashan simcha. And what will bring him the simcha? When he looks up, v'yatza kohen amachutz lamachaneh. Who's there? Who's there? I go to prison to visit people. You know what it means? Because they look up and they say, that's how someone's spending their time. That means something. That matters. That lifts spirits. That gives hope person who's beating themselves up has reason to, who needs to work to bounce back. But if they're all alone, they'll only fall into a deeper depression. And in every respect, we're all a Kohen. In different ways, to family, to friends, we're all those leaders. When we go out, when we go to people, are Vihine near Panega Hatsaras. Heals the Nega Hatsaras, Vihine, the fact that we showed up. When you show up and you check in, and you visit, and you care, and you connect, <coughs> the simple vihine, the simple connecting, is enough that lifts the person's spirit. I already made the bracha before we begin. Not that you would have thought I didn't, but I felt the need to say that for some strange reason anyway. Okay. Uh, Why does it say vahuva, not ba? Why vuhuva not ba? There's also a question, but moving along. Perak Yedalad, Pasig Dalad. We read the Kohen, Betziva Kohen, the Kohen commands. This individual now has been diagnosed as having Tsaras. The way back is two live clean birds, cedar wood, crimson thread, and hyssop. Back to Rav Druk, Lahavosesh. And he says the following Rashi tells us the Pitpute Dvarim, the birds chirped, he chirped, eight eras. Shonagoyim ba malgas zuruch arrogance. You got to bring the cedar and the the worm and the hyssop because a person has to lower themselves from their gaiva. 
אין אמור פעם בשביל מה צריך לשני דברים כדי להעביר לו את המסר הזה. Why wasn't tolas or azov enough? Why do you need two ingredients? You need the azov, the cedar wood, and you need the tolas, you need the crimson thread. Why, need, why do you need, why did he need both of these things in order to be able to bounce back? Both of them are about humility and modesty rather than being arrogant. So why do you need both? Furthermore, he says, And the order that we go in, first is Eitz Erez, which is the tallest, then the Ezov, the Hisap, which is lower, and then the Tolas, the worm, which is the lowest. So we should have gone in the order of lowering himself from the highest, the cedar, to the Hisap, to the worm. We seem to go out of order. So Rav Druk quotes his Rebbe. Answer a difficult Rambam. Won't get into specifics of the Rambam and how he answered the Rambam because I want to get onto other ideas. But with Rav Chaim's answer to a complicated Rambam, Rav Druk answers our question. Because when you want to get better, first you have to go to the extreme. First you have to go all the way down to being worm food, and then you can bounce back and say, but I'm a little better than worm food. I'm an Azov. Hisap. In other words, sometimes if you've acted in an extreme, you got to go to the opposite extreme to bounce back to the middle. And that's why it went out of order. Because we're not going in order from the height to the middle to the lowest. We go all the way to the lowest and we bounce back to the middle because in rehabilitating ourselves, sometimes you have to go to the opposite extreme in order to be able to come back to the middle. I want to tell you an amazing Gera Rosh Hashiva, Shlita. An incredible idea from Mori Varabi Rav Shaul Alter. He says the following. As part of the Metzor's purification, we're supposed to get Aleph. We turn the page. Baruch Hashem. The Oran Shepard, we turn the page. V'hem ira koin mitero sa'isha mitero osam l'fnei Hashem Pesach ha'omoid. The final stage of purification is that this mitzorah comes to the base of Mekdash, comes to the Mishkan, and the Kohen stands him. The one who purifies shall place the person being purified along with them before Hashem at the entrance of the tent of the meeting. Pesach ha'omoid. The Kohen who purifies places the person being purified at the entrance of the ha'omoid, what is the word Lifnei Hashem? Zogdar Ashi, Lifnei Hashem. Where is this place? The gate of Shar Nikanor. Look at Rashi Yedalef. Lifnei Hashem b'Shar Nikanor. What's the Gemara in Sota Dav Zayin? V'lo ba'Azara Atzma. V'fishu Mechusa Kipurim. Now the Kohen can't actually bring him into the Azara. Why not? He's not clean. So where does he bring him? To the entrance. Which entrance? The entrance that's called Shar Nikanor. Called Shar Nikanor. The Gemara Psachim, Daf Pei He, discusses why Shikinur, why Shar Nikanur was not sanctified. The Mitzorah couldn't enter the Azara, but he could stand in that gate. Why was he allowed to stand in that gate? Because the gate was not pure. Why was the gate not purified? The Gemara says it was for this very reason. In order that a Mitzorah would stand there and put his thumb into the Azara, and the oil and the blood would be sprinkled on his thumb into the Azara. So he needed to be able to stand there. So wonders Taisus, Zak Taisus Yevamas Dav Zayinam and Beis. Why couldn't Shar Nikanor be sanctified and the Mitzorah would stand outside Shar Nikanor and stick his thumb in? Why did you have to leave the gate itself not pure so he could stand in the gate and stick his thumb in? Make the gate also pure and he'd stand outside the gate and stick his thumb in. So you know what Rabbeinu Tam answers? Listen to this. So Shar Nikanor was left unsanctified in order to protect the Mitzorah, from the sun and the rain. Because it would be uncomfortable for the Mitzorah. If he had to stand outside in the sun and bake, it could get hot and humid on Harabais, in Yerushalayim in the summer. It could rain in the winter. A sideways rain would knock this Mitzorah over. Says Roshol Alter, that's truly amazing. Think about it. Saras comes as a punishment for one of these seven severe sins. Lashon Hara, murder, swearing falsely, giliarayas, hoardiness, theft, stinginess. So you might have said, you know this individual? Let him bake in the sun. 
Let him get a sunburn. Let him get soaking wet from the rain. Let them gain atonement through their suffering. It should be a kapara. Let them get caught. Let, it'll be a kapara for them. But the Torah teaches otherwise. We must concern ourselves with the comfort even of a sinner, even of the Russia, even of the person who misbehaved, that we also care even about them. That's the sensitivity that we have to have. Never grow so callous that you become indifferent even to the person who's displayed their own indifference. Because that callousness is a poor reflection on us. So the Torah is worried that even that low life, even that Eisvarf, even that Baal Lashon Hara, even that Russia, who violated one of these seven things, also deserves the shade, also deserves not get, to not get wet. So much so, Shari Nikonar is not purified, so he could stand there and stick his thumb in. We can understand why this took place specifically in Shari Nikonar, not one of the other entrances to the Beis HaMikdash, says Rosh Alter. Why? Because Chazal the Gemara Yuma tells us that Nikonar is great mysterious nefesh. Who was Nikonar that he has a Shar named for him? Nikonar was a person. And he displayed tremendous mysterious nefesh, selflessness, to bring doors to the Beis HaMikdash. Where those doors come from? Egypt. Elevating them to great Kedusha from their origins in the most impure land. He transformed them. This is very appropriate for Erev Pesach. He took these doors from the land of Tumma, Egypt, and he transformed and elevated them by using them where? At the entrance to the Beis HaMikdash. The most fitting place for the doors and purify them to Kedusha is the place that shows concern for the well-being of every Yid, regardless of their spiritual standing. Where the Kedusha, the Beis HaMikdash, is sacrificed to ensure the comfort even of sinners is where these doors obtained through mysterious Nefesh should be elevated to Kedusha. There's an important lesson in this too, says of Shal Alter, that a person must draw others close despite the cost of his own individual growth. We saw this about the Kohen, the Tolna Rebbe and the Rav. The Kohen goes out. Kohen goes out even to the place that the leper is. Similarly here, we go out to make it comfortable, even for the mitzvah. We work to raise others, even if it might bring us down. It's like the lesson of the paraduma. The pure become impure, while purifying the one who's impure. Sadiqim said that just as the broom gathers dirt when it sweeps a room, so too one who helps others may find himself somewhat soiled. Just like the broom gathers dirt when it's used to clean, you clean the room. What's left with the, with the broom? It's dirty. So too, when you try to clean someone, something, you can absorb the dirt. Where there's mysterious nefesh for another yid, there's the purification of Kla Yisrael. Of Kla Yisrael. And, that's, uh, and that is the, the message of Shar Nikonor, Dafka, why Shar Nikonor, and why, even though Tosfus answers, we're worried about his comfort. It shouldn't rain, it shouldn't be too cold, even for this low life Mitzorah. Okay, one more idea. The sprinkling, this anointment, this rehabilitation process, it also includes that the oil that's on the coin's palm, he puts on the head of the person being purified. Why? Why on the head? You know who was bothered by this question? The Chavetz Chaim. Chavetz Chaim was bothered. Lahazos Gamal Rosho, even on his head, we don't find this with any Haza in the Mikdash. Anytime there's an anointing in the Beis HaMikdash, of which there are others, we don't find ever the anointing on the head. So why here is there an anointing on the head? Says the Chavetz Chaim. The Mitzorah accepted. Why did they come to speak negatively or hear negative talk about somebody? Because they were thinking negatively. It starts up here and then it comes down and out through the lips. So therefore, not only do the lips need to be purified, but the head needs to be purified. Lashonar is not just about the mouth. Where is the real battle with not gossiping about others? It's not with the lips and the power of speech. Because before a person speaks, hopefully, not always and for some not often, but hopefully, before a person speaks, what do they do? They think. So where is the place of purification in the place of thinking? And that's why the Chavetz Chaim says, unusual, but this is the one place where, where do we anoint and where do we purify? The head. To remind us, think before you speak and have pure thoughts about people, positive thoughts about people. And ayin tov, a good and positive 
I about others before you speak. That's why Davka, that's why Davka, the sprinkling happened where? It happened on the head, not only on the lips. The Zartam has been a Israel. I was going to share one more insight, but we are going to end here. A little bit early because there's a Shabbos Hagadol Drasha that needs a little bit of work still. <laughs> Wishing everyone a Chag Kasher B'Sameach. Should be a good Yontif that's filled with Simcha because the hostages are home. God forbid they're not. We are participating in a campaign as are others. You'll be able to get at the shul or download yourself a, a poster that is uh, of the hostages. Set a seat at the Seder table with no one on it. Put the poster on it. And we should go through our Seder looking at that seat with the collage of hostages remembering that we daven that they come home, to bring them home with the hashtag, hashtag let our people go. Here we are thousands of years after Yitzhiyah's Mitzrayim and we're still saying let our people go. What Moshe and Aaron had to demand of Paro, we demand every moment of every day to Hamas, let our people go. So please God, we won't have an empty chair. The chairs will all be full because the hostages will be home. God forbid they're not. Set aside a chair. Let our people go. Shavachai kosher v'sameach.